Okay, I would like to call the Tuesday, July 18th Long Run Housing Authority Board of Commissioners to order um, before we move. I'd like to, mo uh, I'm going to make a motion to, to suspend by reference council rule of procedure 25.2.8.2 to allow for Commissioner McCoy to participate remotely in this meeting. Do have a second? Second. So it's been moved by myself, Councillor uh, Martin seconded it. Uh, may I have a vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So that passes unanimously. And I would also like to, I'm going to just move forward. Do we need two of these motions? Okay. Yeah. To allow electronic <coughs> participation, participate, uh, participation by Commissioner McCoy for 7-18-2023 Long Island Housing Authority Board of Commissioners meeting. Second. Second. Okay, so Councillor Fidelbo Ferry second with that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It carries unanimously. Uh, so let's have a roll call. I'll start. Uh, Mayor, no. Chair, Joan Peck. Mayor Rodriguez, Commissioner. Marsha Martin, Tim Commissioner. Waters, Tim Waters, Commissioner. Uh, Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Peter Daniels, Planning Supervisor. Marsha Executive Assistant. Commissioner. Tim Hall, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, Susie Hidalgo Ferry, Commissioner. Shakiri Outro, Commissioner. Dave Cole, Intern. Great. Thank you. Uh, now we need approval of the June 13, 2023 minutes. May I want you? I'll move approval. Second. All right. The move by Councilor Waters, second by Councilor Yarbrough. Do we have any questions about those minutes? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That carries unanimously. We are not publicly invited to be heard. Is there anybody in the public? I don't see anyone. So we're closed, publicly invited to be heard. Mm -hmm. Moving on to old and new business, the sale of the 615 Main Street property. Uh, Mayor, we have two red. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We have two resolutions under that? Okay. Yeah, before we start, one of the things I want to say is I appreciate you again accommodating. Um, schedule to, to slide this in between executive session and the other meeting um, based on what we were seeing and meeting with the board here timing in terms of submittal of applications uh, for the next funding round was critical and that's why we asked you all to, to shift the schedule because it's really dependent on the over project and the sale of these other properties so again thank you for accommodating us you're welcome so I'll go ahead and give a very brief introduction about the 615 main building. Um, this is the small commercial building located next to um, what is now being called Village on Main on uh, Main Street. And the Center for People with Disabilities has leased that from us for since at least 2014. And they're interested in buying. And now that we are doing the Village Place resyndication, um, we're separating the two properties and all of the documentation because um, we really don't need to operate that building. And so it could be a good source of revenue generation and serve the mission of the CPWD to be able to stay and provide services to the community. Um, the, we did a market analysis of the property value. It was $642,000. Um, we've been negotiating with the CPWD a reduced purchase price in exchange for services. The price we've agreed to as of tonight is $500,000. Um, so that $140,000 difference is really five years worth of services, about $28,000 per year to provide enhanced outreach to LHA residents um, that experience disabilities or care for someone with a disability, um, really doing targeted outreach to them, increasing uptake in their services, doing training and life skills sessions, etc. So what you have here is a resolution to approve the purchase and sale agreement. Um, and I do need to mention that we still need to work out an easement with them once we're, after the purchase and sale agreement is signed, then we start working with title and preparing for closing and we need to 
work with them on an easement to make sure that they still have um, access across the village on main property to get to their building and, and parking and such. So that's something that we would follow up with. Um, and then the second resolution is to, to approve the memorandum of understanding that we can negotiate with them for those services. Great, thank you for that explanation. Can I have a motion for resolution 2023-22? I move approval of resolution 2023-22. And I'll second that. So it's been moved by Councilor Waters, seconded by myself. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, Commissioner Waters, I'm yeah. sorry. Just call me whatever. <laughs> okay, it's been moved by whatever. <laughs> all those opposed? Uh, that passes unanimously. Resolution 2023-23, approve uh, execution of memorandum of understanding with the Center for People with Disabilities. Can I have a motion? I move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Martin. Uh, seconded by, no, it's been approved Love by whatever. Commissioner Martin, seconded by Commissioner Waters. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, Aye. that passes unanimously. We have another resolution. Uh, is someone going to explain this one? Um, sure. Very briefly. Okay. Um, this is just approval of the contract with Roseman and Associates, our architect on the Village on Main Rehab and Resignification Project. Um, we selected them from a competitive RFP late last year, and they've been operating on, off of a letter of agreement while we got ready for tax credits in the middle. We have been awarded tax credits, and we are working on finalizing the agreement. Um, as part of this, they're also holding some of their invoices until closing so that we can just plan ahead and everything really happens at closing at this point. So I'm available for any questions. So I move uh, resolution 2023-24, which is the approval of the execution of a contract with Roseman and Associates. Um, can I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All of those opposed. That passes unanimously. And now at resolution 2023-25, the dedication of the project is vouchers. Okay, so we're gonna be a good amount of discussion on this one. Um, we're really trying to focus our time tonight on item C and D, at least from the staff side. Um, so we, the LHA has authority to issue 26 project-based vouchers at this time. Um, you might recall, recall that in, earlier in the spring, um, we did one round of competitive awards for project-based vouchers that were awarded to Village on Main. And this is our second round that we are putting out to really focus on family properties. And so we did a competitive RFP process, um, which is required by the, the HUD rules for putting these out. Um, out of our 26 that we have authority to issue, back in 2020, late 2021, early 2022, when we were negotiating the Prism 2 deal, we agreed with MGL and put it in our development agreement that at some point in time, if eight project-based vouchers were available, then we would um, dedicate them to Christman 2. Um, that is going to come back into play for a moment. So if we consider um, the 26 and then the potential eight for Christman 2, then that leaves 18. So when we put out our request for proposals for uh, projects that would use the vouchers, we used it, we put out 18 for competitive. Um, we ended up receiving two proposals. One is for the Ascent on Hover project, and then one is for, um, that's they requested the full 18, and then the Atwood Commons project requested eight. Um, so basically we do not have enough vouchers to, issue, to commit to all of them now. As we work on our two-year tool over the next few years, that's always um, assuming we get extra HUD funding and do our performance measures, we should be able to increase our voucher authority over time. But at this time, we don't have enough vouchers to issue all of them. So I have really kind of laid out in your council, council Tom, in your memo to the Housing Authority Board what we have to, to think about here. So for the Christman project. That project is already in construction. They have thought they have filled their gap to the point that they made it to a deal and they are constructing. So really at this point, adding project-based vouchers, um, depending on which units they put them on, could 
make some of those units more affordable to lower income families but also on the financing side what it would really do is allow mgl to make their fee quicker because the, the, the property would perform better they wouldn't make more because we have agreed to developer fees etc but they would make that quicker and lha could come in quicker um they also didn't need to respond to the proposal because it's very um, interesting rules, but if you are able to fund your project without the vouchers, you don't have to compete for them. So they didn't have to respond. So they can just kind of be considered on the on the side. Um, I should also say that for Chrisman, we can apply those vouchers at any time. All that they're looking for is performance improvement, not necessarily getting a deal to prove it. Um, so that is something to consider. On Hover and Atwood, those two we did perform evaluations on subject to the criteria that we put in the RFP. And so those scoring sheets are in your file. Hover did score higher because it hit some of the key parameters we were going for based on our community need for family units and, and you know, special um, extraordinary uh, benefits to the community. But they're both eligible and they both have really good, good points about them. They just kind of apply them in a different way. Um, I would say that the likelihood of Chaffa awarding both Hover and Atwood is extremely low, extremely low. We're more likely to get neither of them funded than both of them funded in, the sing in a single year. And so um, what we had thought of as an option that is outlaid in your uh, memo is that because Chaffa will ultimately be making this decision, at least for 2023, that we could wait and see which projects get selected, if any. Um, that gives some flexibility to say, you know, if, if one moves forward faster than the other, then we can go with that one and then um, look long term if that project stays on the radar and keeps trying then we can see how our voucher authority increases or, or availability is out there. Um, to do that, we would have to put a hold on considering the Christmas vouchers. Mm -hmm. And so I, if, if we waited for Chaffa to decide on an awarded project between the two, we would know in about November. And at that time, if both aren't awarded, which again, the, the um, chances are very, very low, then we could pick that Christmas decision back up as well. So that is the recommendation from staff is to um, put conditional awards out for both the, the Hover and Atwood projects, see which one is successful in tax credits, and then recircle back in November to see if Christmas needs to be considered or if we need to, um, if none are awarded, do we just consider what happens in 2020? Um, are the developers aware that there are any co competition and so mm -hmm. how much we going out of business because of us? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, these projects, the project-based vouchers are so valuable and both projects are, are seeking outside funding from various places, but um, this is these red vouchers are really critical to these projects being feasible, sure. and so um, that's why if you conditionally award both, then we can see what happens and then really make the call. And hopefully, eventually, all of them could get what they need, but it might just have to be scheduled out. So, um, I do have questions, so but let's make the motion for a moment open for discussion. So do I have a motion to uh, move resolution 2023-24? Um, no, I'm sorry, 2023-25. Is it spelled out or do you need us to decide whether the dedication property? It is spelled out in the resolution uh, where it conditionally dedicates 18 to the ascent at Hover, eight to Atwood, subject to award of Litex in 2023. We don't get specific on Christmas because we kind of just um, push that decision to November in this recommendation. So, can I have a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to uh, move resolution 2023 25. Is there any discussion? And I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. 
So how often can you apply for these project-based vouchers? For example, if you don't get any of them, is it open again next year? Is it open in six months? Is it, at what point is this gonna be on hold? It is open as long as we have the authority to issue it and uh, that we can work it into our voucher, you know, big network of how well the vouchers piece together. So I would say just for some precedent, the last time LHA put out project-based vouchers was in advance of the 2018 Fall River project. So it's been several years, but also we're making big changes in our voucher program and strides and trying to grow it. And so I wouldn't expect that we would have to wait that long again to get more project-based vouchers. Okay. So, yeah, it's pretty important. All right, so that has been, a motion's been made, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. So that passes unanimously. We're now at resolution 2023-26, approving of certain matters in connection with the ASCIP, ASCIP at Boulder Crossing. And our development partnership is coming in, and they're gonna be showing a presentation for us. Eric, do you have that presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So I'm ready to show it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yeah, we can just kind of cluster the group. Yeah. No, you're not. We're asking some questions about where it is. Yeah, it's exciting. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Should we get some uh, roll call here? Any questions? We can do that too. Nice to go. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll go first. I've met you all before. I was here a couple months ago. I'm Shannon Cox Baker. Um, Regional Vice President for the Penrose Mountain Region Office. So, good to see you and get down to it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Weining, a new member of the Penrose team joining Shannon here. I live in Denver and most recently for the last two and a half plus years worked in the city and county of Denver in the housing department. I'm Tom Anderson. I'm a senior vice president with Penrose. I oversee the western states from Chicago to Texas and out here to Colorado. I'm actually based in Kansas City. Wow, Kansas City. Huge area. So, um, do you want to lead this discussion? Sure, I was going to let them kind of present the concept of the project first right. as we prepare for tax credit applications. No, I'm driving, Shannon. Okay. Are, are we behind? We can make this as fast as we can. We're good now. We're good now. Okay. We moved too quick. Okay. We just have a handful of slides. Just wanted to kind of, I think when I was here a couple of months ago, it was still very conceptual. We hadn't really mm -hmm. totally dialed in exactly what we were doing. So the first few slides is just really to bring you up to speed on where we are. And then, um, and then we have some pretty pictures at the end. So, um, so we've officially named the project The Ascent at Hover Crossing, um, which I think is a, a really great name. Um, and it's uh, reflected a bit in the, the architecture as well and sort of, um, a nod to the mountain landscape. Um, so just to kind of catch you up on um, the work we've done since we were selected as um, LHA's development partner, uh, which obviously that's the first one there, the RFP process concluded in December of last year. And so that really was when we kicked off in earnest with our um, uh, visioning for the project and putting all the parts and pieces together. And since that time, um, we've um, been able to bring in, um, with the city uh, and LHA support, the ARPA funds for the project. Um, we've been developing a concept in addition to the housing around an early childhood <coughs> education center on the property, which could have uh, three to four classrooms. Um, we've been 
a lot of really fun conversations with Laura Plum about being the operator for that ECE. A lot of um, really thoughtful, you know, dialogue around what that would look like and um, how we would fund that. There's a huge need for more Head Start early childhood classes, and this is just a great site for it. Um, so we're we can give you a little bit more detail on that, but really looking to knit that into the to the overall development. And then I think it was just last month we were also conditionally awarded 1.8 million from the city in stock funds for the project, uh, and we've also secured a funding award from or a soft funding award or soft funding commitment from the Colorado Division of Housing. So, um, and then tonight, obviously, with the conditional PPD award. So, uh, all of that is to say we are perfectly on track for our August first low-income housing tax credit application submission. So just shy of two weeks to get that submitted. Um, the total capital stack of the project is about 35, 37 million. And so we're fully, fully sourced, we should say, for um, being able to fund the construction of the housing piece. And so the, the financing for the early childhood education piece is sort of running on its own track. And we've been having lots of really good conversations with foundations um, and with the state. Uh, and obviously we're aware of Boulder County where the cause applications are coming too. So we're really trying to figure out how we can piecemeal together funding to pay for that piece too. And um, I went, jumped right into the financing. We'll talk a little bit more about the programming and the unit mix and the AMI mix. But just in terms of schedule, you know, again, tax credit applications due August 1st. Awards would be announced in mid-November. And if we kind of, uh, if we get an award and we keep running on our current schedule, we would be looking at closing on the financing and breaking ground about this time next year. So oh, that would be that would be approved. We're hoping for that. Uh, see you next this time. Time. Yeah. This is very touchy. Yeah. Let's go over that. Hang on. Let me try again. Oh, the last That was the outline. We just died right now. Okay. Right. Maybe, let's come back to this one and then, um, <laughs> this is um, oh, this is incredibly summary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I have to stand up. Okay. Um, so this isn't, this isn't super fun to look at. We'll get to the pictures in a minute, but it's, we're talking about a total of 75 apartments. Um, and you can see here, if you follow the column down, 21 bedrooms, 22 bedrooms, 21 threes, and six four bedrooms. So. Again, the original vision for the project was to really serve as many large families as possible. And so I think um, where we're at with you know 27 total three and four bedroom units is, is going to make a big dent, I think, in the, in the city's inventory of larger housing units. And then if you follow um, across this way, and I know these are, this is small font, but um, the, the income mix is here. So um, we've got 18 units at 30% AMI, <coughs> 9 at 40% AMI, and 4 at 50 percent AMI, which combined is about 42, 43% of the whole 75 units would be at 50% AMI and below. And then the balance of that um, are at 70 and 80% AMI. And so the average income for the whole project is about 57% AMI. And we can talk a little bit more about what that means, but income, income averaging is um, a new way to finance these types of projects. And so it does require a blend of um, the very low income rents and the very high income rents, but they have to average at 60 or below. So we, we manage to accomplish that. Um, again, income averaging, really the, there's a couple of reasons why it's important to do that. Um, one of the key ones is it, it allows us to serve a really wide band of, of households, right? Anywhere from really 30% AMI to 80% AMI, which is a nice mix across the spectrum. It also allows for some cost subsidies, so those higher income units can help us provide more lower rents, <coughs> and um, you know again sort of cost subsidized with the higher and the lower rents. And then um, three and four bedroom units are more expensive to build, um, so again that's all of these parts and pieces sort of fit together. Um, we don't have any 60% AMI units at least targeted to that because that's there's a lot of that in Longmont. So we're really trying to serve on the, the lower and the higher end of that. Um, so just to point this out here, this is sort of the this um, the floor plan. As you can see, there's really two buildings. They're kind of bifurcated by a walkway here that connects 
to your senior properties up there. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the names? Homer. Homer. I'm sorry. Hearthstone and Lodge. Yeah. So that would cross the street there, and it's just a nice visual connection to those properties. But they really, the connection here is to the community building. And so the community building would have a playground. Um, there would be indoor space for, you know, could be game nights or um, just indoor play area for residents. Um, mail would be there, property management would office there, would be a leasing office there, and maintenance. So right there in the middle of the property. Fitness center. What's that? Fitness center. And fitness center, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then in blue here, it's <clears throat> where we're targeting the early childhood education. So it's a nice anchor on the corner, it's a two story building. And again, um, whether or not the financing comes together for that, the housing stands on its own. So we're moving ahead. Where we are? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Shannon okay. touched on this a little bit, but the kind of the income averaging thing is a new addition to the IRS tax credit program a few years back, and really until this past year didn't take off because there are lots of questions around how it would work. But on paper, the idea is exactly what Shannon said, right? That you know, within the same level of revenue production from the property, you can serve a much wider swath of residents, including those who, who are in far less and get out of the kind of box that everybody was in before, which is making as many units as possible at 60% AMI because that used to be the upper cap. And so you'd get a whole bunch of properties that had all of the units restricted at 60% AMI, which certainly there was a great need for, but you started to see like we did in our market set here where there's a, there's a bit of a saturation um, at that level. And so being able to diversify what they offer is one great reason to do it. Mm -hmm. Another, again, is to get out of that kind of concentration at 60% AMI. And then just from a market perspective, this slide is something that I put together in a, in, a, in a prior life, but it kind of shows based on data and analytics across the metro kind of area in Denver that when you're comparing it to, to new build, multifamily, decent quality products, right, that there, there is a gap at the 80% level currently, but what's more important is if you look 10 or 15 years out, if the trend continues where rents grow, housing costs grow at a clip faster than incomes, you'll see a much you know, wider swath and a definite gap where there will be an imminent need. And so while we're not underwriting and expecting to maximize the absolute maximum rents on those units, it allows the property to be able to continue to operate and, and provide a service that is important now and will be even increasingly more important in 10 or 15 years in the life of this project. And we feel like that's a, an important component and, a, and perhaps an underappreciated aspect of the income management program. So it looks complicated on paper, but we feel like it's a ultimately a better outcome because of the diversity and because of the, the kind of the the, the the mix of interests and backgrounds and, and incomes that can live together in one place and share the same amenities and hopefully build each other's education center. And speaking of, um, just again, you know, this isn't a kind of wouldn't it be cool if we did this? We we put some rigor behind it. We've had our architect team kind of design it, they, they're familiar with state requirements. We've talked a lot well about it. They've helped put together kind of what this looks like, but effectively we've got what we believe can be three classrooms plus all of the requisite kind of family reception areas, you know, playground square footage for every kid, indoor and outdoor, um, in a very safe and secure and easy to access um, environment. So just for fun, we kind of just show you guys we, that this is kind of what we're thinking it would it would look like. You could fit it onto the site and, um, you know, with Wild Plum as a as a kind of partner in this whole thing, we think we can hopefully pull together right this added component, which would make a great project even that much greater. And then the rest, I think, were just images from from our architect team. If you want to just flip through them, Molly, you know, quickly or slowly, but that's just kind of images of what it would what it would look like. You can see in the lower left corner kind of the aspect you're looking at. I believe this is the southeast mm -hmm. corner looking northwest. Uh, opposite corner, but that's the that would be the you know early childhood education center. You can kind of see the exterior, the the signage, and there'll be a, a a protected stairwell from upstairs to downstairs to get to the playground without having to go through the parking lot or um, anything like that. And then kind of a, a bird's eye view, the whole property. I think it's one or two more, but just to see you, and that, that's kind of looking directly at that. That would be the EC building on the left with the kind of its own. Uh, playground, community center, kind of on your on your right as you look through it from the, from the north, I guess that would be. Maybe we can go back to the, the resolution. 
slide if you want to see it. Um, so this this is I think what's before you all this evening um, is to approve the resolution to essentially authorize um, uh, LHA to negotiate and enter into a developer MOU uh, with Penrose and a purchase and sale agreement and then um, upon an award of tax credits it would be the next step which is negotiating the co-general partner development agreement the special limited partner agreement the property management agreement um, and then uh, subsequently all the loan agreements that would come into the deal with the you know, 1.8 million the ARPA funds um, and then the, the seller carry note which is how the, the land will get transferred into the project and then um, lastly just to execute and deliver any all, and you know all other documents uh, related to closing on the financing for the tax credit partnership so that that's it for our presentation we're happy to answer any questions you have um, I'll just be here to be helpful the agreements <clears throat> that are detailed here or to which you referred uh, what all be seriously negotiated subsequent to the awarding of tax credits? There's there's two that we need in order to apply for the tax credits, the purchase and sale agreement, um, and which is conditioned on an award of tax credit amongst several yeah. other things. And then we, we really feel like it's good practice to, you know, um, at least put on paper and agree to the business terms of the co-developer agreement. So that's what the MOU is. And that's really more of a good faith agreement that will then be replaced after a tax credit award with a legally binding developer agreement. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of solar panels on those roofs. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, this an energy resource for the city and all the details of that fleshed um, out yet, or is that a separate? We are, we have a, a minimum requirement through the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority. So to apply for tax credits, we have to hit a, a what is a pretty high benchmark for green building and sustainability features. So we're, we're definitely doing that, but we've been having, we've had one kickoff design meeting with our, um, our sustainability consultants, with folks from Longmont Power, um, to really talk about like how do we how do we integrate this with some of the bigger goals and the vision that the city has in terms of you know um, energy conservation and renewable generation and so we're sort of at the early stages of that. This is a hundred percent electric building. So there would be no gas subsidies, which we're excited about. Um, we've also had conversations with Platte River Power, mm -hmm. and so Platte River is going to be in in the discussion on all of this and uh, probably for batteries and some other components but there's a chance this can connect to a larger distributed energy system in that area that we're still trying to put all of it together. Yeah. Okay, seeing no more discussion, do we have a motion to uh, Motion for resolution 2023-26, approve certain matters in connection with the ascent at Hoover Crossing. I'll move resolution um, 2023-26. All right. Yes. Oh, thank you, Commissioner <coughs> McCoy. So that was moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. 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 Fingers crossed. We need it. Yeah. In November. Yeah. 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 Have you looked into heat pumps? At heat pumps? Yeah. Um, like a ground source heat pump? Or yes. like a, um, we have not done looked at that, no. Um, I think it's a bit cost prohibitive on a project of this scale, but and I'm not an engineer, but I think the mechanical systems do also operate on heat pumps and are, are pretty efficient for like the little package units for each of the apartments. So I'm not a my dad. <laughs> but I like the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is yes, but by the individual units, not for the entire problem. Right. Because, of, because it is 100% electric. Right. You have to have that heat pump technology right there. But these are rentals, correct? Yes. yes. So we would be responsible for the individual units putting them in if we, if we 
is that cost prohibitive as well? That's we're building it. We're building it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't understand that. <laughs> thank you. I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all believing for that. Thanks. Oh. If I could take two, or a quick minute. The one thing I would say is, so you take this action with one of a few things today related to uh, project-based vouchers and in this project. Um, if one of them gets selected by uh, CHAFA for tax credits, uh, we will be at property four on our six property goal. If oh, two okay. of them do it, we'll be at five, and that's obviously not as great the work we're doing with Mustang. So, a mm -hmm. um, lot of progress to get that six. Mm -hmm. I'm really go time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're at the last resolution, 2023-27, approval of tenant accounts receivable write-offs. So we have started the collection process. We have sent 13 tenants over to collections mm -hmm. with a total of $25,000. Mm -hmm. um, most of that is attributed to three and a half units, which total about 249000 of that. Um, the rest are s s small and normally Harold approves those, but since we are doing this big chunk and it was such a large amount, we just said let's have the board go ahead and approve that. We had three that are not going to collections. Um, two of those are um, deceased tenants. Um, one we had to get a police report because the guy ended up moving out and he passed away at another hotel or apartment complex. Um, and then one actually passed away um, in house. So, um, those will we'll go ahead and write off. And then the other one was so low, it was under $500. That was just not mm -hmm. all the administrative work to send to collections. So we're writing them off too. Are people still in the units other than two that passed? No, out? these are all passed. Oh, these okay. are all passed okay. tenants. So these are all the ones that we did our due diligence to try to get a payment plan okay. um, with them. A lot of them don't give us forwarding addresses. So it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to. <laughs> connect with anybody but um my understanding is it goes to collections and we have up to six years to try to collect on this um but the write-off is to write it off the books um because we don't want our property managers as well doing any of the collections so once it's once it's at collections they forward all communication um to the collection agency and they'll work with them here okay good job plus that probably clears up with that new software system <laughs> yeah. Not less um, open ended. Yeah. Files. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. It makes our list go a little uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then you're, you're doing, you're trying to do this ahead of budget. Well, right. we'll start doing this. So, what we want to start doing is actually coming to the board at, at the point we're sending these to collection, especially okay. if we haven't had it written off by you. Um, so, the majority we'd like to get written off as much as we can by the end of the year so as long as books is written up and we're not putting this huge amount of the government accounts Makes on sense. the books. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that as we go. Harold can approve anything 5,000 or less and okay. if that's the case, he'll approve them and just be giving them a list and then we're going to say here's what's, what's all been written off. I imagine forward going unless they're the meth unit, it's usually the, the meth units or the higher mm -hmm. damaged units um, that will have to be. All right, thank you for that. Can I have a motion for 2023-27? Seven. Approval of tenant accounts receivable write-offs. So moved. Second. <coughs> so it's been moved by Commissioner Martin, uh, seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo there, and that's all in favor? All right. All those opposed. So that passes unanimously. Do we have any comments from the commissioners? No, just, just, just on this last set of tables. It would be helpful to me uh, if we could have a table that would be a little more easily read than yeah. one that's in. Yeah, that, that came account. specifically from DC Services, so it's, it's a report that they generate. Um, we can definitely. Whoever generates it, if it's going to show up in our packet, yeah, it yeah. ought to be readable. What, um, what data? This is a general. Because I might just have to tell them what fields to select. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. I know, I just have the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, I just enlarged it and I read it online just so I could see it. So it, it's in there. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. We'll try and flag it if we have a document that needs to be printed in large format. So we'll try and flag it out. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I didn't have to come online here because this was too small. <laughs> so could I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Okay, moved by Commissioner uh, Waters, signed by Commissioner Double Fairing. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? We are adjourned.